the side you never hear preached on. Amen. Admonition to the king. Yeah. Yeah. Admonitions to the king. Proverbs chapter 31, we'll start reading at verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. Instructions to the king from his mother. Lemuel, you know, is another name for Solomon. And his mother was Bathsheba. And Bathsheba had made her share of mistakes. You remember the illicit story between her and King David. But evidence suggests that Bathsheba had repented of that sin between the death of that first child and the birth of Solomon she had became a woman of faith and she's here trying to instruct her child trying to instruct her son on what he ought to do and how he ought to conduct himself if he was a king Heavenly Father I pray today that you would help us to receive instruction. Lord, that we could listen to the words of God, not listen to the voice of the devil that whispers in our ear and tries to draw us away from the path of truth. Help us, Lord, to give heed unto thy word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So then Proverbs chapter 31, uh, Bathsheba endeavors to instill godly principles in her son. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to take time with your children to instill some godly principle Amen. when they come up with some uh, area of their life? In the first nine verses, she gives admonitions and warnings, then finishes the chapter with the description of a virtuous woman and said she's hard to find. Amen. From which I'll say, Amen, brother, Amen. Right. Solomon is warned about wine in verse 4. He's warned about women in verse 3. And he's warned about song of the drunkards via Psalm 69, 12 and verse 7 through 8. If you just stop for a minute and compare chapter 30, the same fellow is being taught, but not by a woman. He's been taught by a man. He's been taught by a man who was a hero in his daddy's army. The man that had instructed him was a man that, that somehow... He, was, he had found himself in a deep spiritual abasement. And he confesses his own ignorance as to how to govern life. And he confesses that ignorance is not relieved by natural investigation, but can only be relieved by revelation. Amen. 
in chapter uh, 30 and verse 5 and 6, he argues that God is the one that will instruct us the way we need to go. The one request of Agur is to remove me from extremities. Amen. That's exactly what the devil wants to make out of us. Is extreme on the right or extreme on the left. Uh, too much wealth and we'll forget God. Here's something for the liberals. Too much poverty will beget crime. You know, we say, well, uh, uh, they, they, he said, look at verse 8 and 9. Let me read those. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me lest I be full and deny thee and say who is the Lord or lest I be poor and steal. You see how poverty begat his stealing. Poverty begat his, his uh, life of wickedness. But I want to say this today that if you are a child of God it will stop you from stealing. I don't care how poor you are. Amen. You won't have to steal because that one that feeds the sparrows will feed you. Amen. That one that cares for every lily of the field will put clothes on your back. Amen. That one that told us, let us work with our own hands and not him that steal, let him steal no more. Amen. Too much poverty fosters stealing and cussing. In verse 9, Proverbs chapter 4, this same man is taught by his daddy. Proverbs chapter 30, he's taught by this reverend person, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Proverbs chapter 31, he's taught by mommy. Now, now let me go back to this word reverence. I never really liked to be called reverend. I ne it never just, it just didn't... Uh, 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 suit me well because Psalm chapter 111 verse 9 said that God's name is to be reverent. We're to have reverence for the name of God. Amen. So I never did really care about anybody putting Reverend Wilson on my name. Uh, pastor's fine with me. Amen. Preacher's fine with me. Uh, I'm, not real, I'm not real sure that brother is what you ought to call me. <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm some of you. <laughs> but reverence is to be given not only to God, watch this, but if you get into this thing, reverence is be given to mom and dad. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16, we're told to honor our father and our mother. Amen. That's the same thing as reverence. That is to fear them and listen to them and give, a, a, give attention to what they say, what they tell us, because mom and dad wants to do what's right Amen. by you. Amen. It's akin to the word respect. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 17, the man teacher said, a man that has no respect for his mom or his dad, the ravens will eat his eyes out. It's Disrespect is one of the one of the major crimes of modern America. Amen. We don't realize the value of a praying mom or a praying dad, Amen. or for that matter, a praying pastor. Amen. Disrespect starts in the home. Amen. It generally starts by one parent being disrespectful to the other parent and teaching Junior that mommy don't matter but needs to be disrespectful. That's right. Amen. Or it starts with uh, uh, mommy saying daddy doesn't matter and teach their children, if you don't show any respect for your wife or you don't show any respect for your husband or you don't show any respect for your pastor or you don't show any respect for the church house, how do you think your children are going to show Amen. Disrespect. So if calling me reverend will get you to respect me, help yourself. There's an easy transition 
from disrespect for mom or dad to disrespect for the teacher or the preacher or disrespect for the church or the church house or disrespect for society and the laws of the land and ultimately disrespect for God. Amen. Oh, because children were not brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Bring children up that way, the Bible tells us. And Bathsheba had vowed a vow that she would do that for Solomon. Similar to the vow that Hannah had gave about her son, I will train him for God's service. Amen. Now, about mama's boys. Let me say, uh, do not make your boy effeminate. I mean, if he's a boy, let him be a boy. Yeah. A, a, a curse of an overprotective mother Amen. is a, a little boy that wants to wear a skirt yeah. or lipstick or earrings or necklaces or any one 10,000 other things I see in our society today. Yeah. A king needs to be able to throw off that soft raiment, Matthew chapter 11, verse 8, and learn to be a man. That's what we need to teach a boy to be. We need to teach a boy to be a man and stand on his own two feet and not be dependent on mom and dad to carry him all their life. Amen. Verse 3, he said, don't give, don't give your strength to a woman. Now, that is a... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm well aware that he's talking about not to be a womanizer there, but I also believe that it's telling us don't make, don't make little girls out of little boys. Amen. The feminization of America today. Right. Amen. Amen. We've got girls in the army, yeah. and we've got boys changing diapers. <laughs> not my house. Amen. Hello. Amen. You say, preacher, that's not politically correct. You bet your booties, Granny. Amen. I guarantee you, you're looking at one politically incorrect preacher. Amen. They ain't raised no queers yet. Amen. And if one comes through my church, he don't stay long. Amen. Talking about, warning about, uh, give not your strength to women. Then that's real. That's just a, a an offshoot. Hang on, I'm gonna preach here in a minute. Amen. Warning about wine. Now, if I could go into the biblical teaching about wine and about modern medicine, they did not have modern medicine. They did not have morphine or Demerol or anything to knock the pain out of somebody that had been wounded in battle or somebody that was dying on the battlefield. If the only narcotic you have, and that's what alcohol is, a narcotic, if it's the only thing you got, then he's recommending that you use that for this perishing man. And alcohol is not a food. Alcohol is a narcotic. Alcohol costs, and I don't know how long ago this statistic was made, but in a, in a report that I was reading, alcohol costs $200 billion a year. Right. Not in consumption, in damage. Amen. Understand what I'm saying? That's not counting the price that you paid for that beer or that wine. That's the cost of the broken homes and broken lives and broken fences and bro hey man, everything in the world tore down because of alcohol. Amen. We get on television and we say tobacco's bad. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew anybody to get high on a cigarette and run down a fence post. Amen. Amen. But I know the bunch of them got high on liquor and dope and run down it. Am I telling it right? Amen. Somebody I say, Amen, preacher. Amen. They say that it costs every man, woman, boy, and girl in America eight hundred dollars a year just to pay for the damage that's done in this country by alcohol. Not to consider the fifty thousand deaths every year from drunk drivers, and 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 we won't even mention cocaine that costs one hundred and fifty billion. Yeah. 
And his warning is, listen, you, it's not for a king to get into that stuff. Yeah. Understand that the king was the man that was in charge of the wine supply. The king was the man that authorized whether you could get rations that day or not. Yeah. Look at verse 4. She said, son, listen to this. It's not for kings. Amen. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink. I'll just give you a few reasons here. Number one, it destroys your personal integrity. Amen. You get hung up on alcohol or dope. The next thing you know, your integrity has gone. Amen. And Amen. Your, your dignity has gone. And you'll give anything just to get a hold of another bottle of beer. Yes. Amen. Amen. You, you heard that story about the man takes a drink and the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Number two, whenever you get all looped up on alcohol, it disparages respect for anybody else. Yeah. Amen. Number three, it impairs your judgment. Yeah. And judgment for making decisions whether that be in driving an automobile or legislation in Congress. Amen. If you're full of alcohol, and somebody told me there's three parties in Washington, D.C., you got the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Cocktail Party. Yeah. Amen. And that bunch of drunks gets up there and makes laws for decent citizens to live by. Amen. Well, let me help you. All Christians are kings, according to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. So all Christians ought to stay away from wine. Amen. You said, well, it's supposed to be given to them that are ready to perish. Well, I want you to know that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish. Amen. I'm not in danger of perishing. I might be in danger of dying, but I'm not in danger of perishing. Amen. Nothing worse than a drunk preacher. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 7 and following talks about the uh, a table full of vomit because the preachers had gone astray. Yeah. You say, oh, I don't believe. Well, let, let me, let's read it. Isaiah chapter 28. I'll get there. Wait on me. Whenever you find it, you be seated. Isaiah chapter 28. I'll start verse 7. They also have erred through wine and through strong drink and are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in Vision, they stumble in judgment, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. That sounds like a Roman Catholic church to me. Amen. Or maybe a Presbyterian. Hello! Amen. Wine has no place in the house of God. Amen. None. Amen. Uh, you say, well, we use it in communion. We'll stop. It has no place in the house of God. Wine is to be administered medically as an anesthetic. A, a much better product and still under that classification if you want to take it is vinegar. Matthew chapter 27 verse 24. But when Jesus the king hung on the cross and they offered him that vinegar Am I, amen, am I preaching right? He said, no thanks, I'm a king. I don't want your vinegar. I don't want your stupefaction. I don't want your anesthesia. I'll do well just to go ahead and take it the way my God gives it to me. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, a little wine used for your stomach's sake. And I guarantee you, you'd be better off if you'd just go ahead and read that word vinegar in there. It'll help you out, man. It'll help your stomach out. You say, oh, preacher, you're going to doctrine now. No, you, I'm not prescribing nothing. You just take your big swig of it. Of course, I guarantee you, you probably need some orange juice or something for a chaser. <laughs> 150 times 
The Old Testament uses the word wine, but the meaning is always determined by the context it's used in. And drunkenness is condemned in both Testaments, both of them. The New Testament and the Old Testament. Wine, Proverbs chapter 20, mocks you and promises relief and grants torture. It gets you into fights and everything else, just hanging around the beer joint. Doesn't satisfy your thirst. It's like diet pop. I thought I'd wake you up there. False happiness, false security, and it leads to poverty. And a king ought to fool with it. Not only is it a false hope, but it impairs any real hope that you could get. Yeah, Dying people don't need false hope. Amen. Suffering people, uh, uh, they, don't, they need a solution. And alcohol doesn't give them hope or solution. I think in the hands of doctors today, we've committed too much. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We think just because the doctor prescribed it, ain't nothing wrong with it. Uh-huh. Amen. And doctors tell us about this. Let me talk to you about Terry Shivo. You remember her? Yeah. That girl that the doctors and the judges got together and murdered. That's because her husband wanted to be rid of her. They said, well, she's unresponsive. Have you ever heard of uh, Kate Adamson? Had that stroke and lay there for 70 days, unresponsive, and woke up? Another warning in verse 8 and 9. Justice also belongs to the hand of the king. If you've got an opportunity to judge in a case, you certainly need to have an opportunity to be used of God and not abuse your authority. Prosecutors are similar to the devil. (laughs) You say, preacher, where'd you get that? I'm glad you asked. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I don't know where you've had any dealings with the courthouse. I have never been arrested. Listen to me. But I've been down to that courthouse trying to bail you turkeys out more than once. And prosecutors are real close to the devil. Revelation chapter 12, look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to the death. Rejoice, it said, ye heavens. We're rid of that turkey. No more prosecuting attorney. No more people to bring charges against you. Amen. They got it in their blood, son. That's why in our Constitution we installed a Bill of Rights that they're trying their best to get rid of because prosecutors and, and, and grand juries, I heard they could indict a ham sandwich for being Jewish. I don't know whether you know this or not, but in order to gain the office of attorney general, uh, they'll not only tell the truth on you, but they'll embellish it. (laughs) If what we've got isn't enough evidence, we'll cook up some evidence. That's not for a king. This is an admonition. If you're a king and somebody comes before you, you're supposed to give them justice. Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good here on these earthly courts if we could just get justice? Amen. It looks to me like they let the criminals go and put the good folks in jail. Yeah. Amen. You take It's like on a job. You get a guy on a job, he'll lay around, won't work. Amen. And they, 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 they'll just baby him, try to get him to do something. But you get a guy, will work, lay down on the job, and they'll fire him in a day. How, how's that work? Whatever happened there? The purpose is justice with that king. 
And it said he's to defend those that can't even defend their self. I wonder what that would say about the abortion clinic. Amen. I wonder what that would say about the the uh, uh, orphans and the people of our land that don't have a chance, don't have an opportunity, and they come before court. Somebody said, "Oh, this land, this land is everybody's equal." Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you trying to tell me that I can go to court and get the same treatment as Jay Rockefeller? If you believe that, I got some ocean front property in Montana I'd like to sell you. Amen. This thing is set up where you've got crooked prosecutors and crooked lawyers and crooked judges. Yeah. Am I telling it right? Amen. And then not to mention crooked people. Yeah. Amen. I think the whole world is guilty before God. Amen. I think the whole outfit needs to go to hell. Yeah. But hallelujah, I found out about a king that came to set the captive free. A king that came to give us a, a real mercy and real judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. If you're in any position of authority, you ought to read this and uh, take heed to what Bathsheba tried to teach her son. Some of those lessons he learned. He's real good in some of them. Some of them he didn't do so well at. I guess that means he's human. So we don't never want to get to thinking that we're too big to fall. Amen. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Learn the lesson, king. Learn the lesson well. And you'll have a good kingdom. Let's bow for prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How do you do when... Thank you. 
wages stealing on Your body bends beneath the weight of care He will not forsake you then He'll go with you to the end Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there Leave it there, leave it there Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there If you'll trust in that bird now He will surely bring you out Take your burden